Hello, hello. Thank you, everyone, for spending this uh, afternoon uh, with me. Uh, thanks. I see many of my colleagues from the current work and from previous also workplaces. So welcome, guys. Thank you for being here. So the idea of monolithic front-end in applications were living from, with us from the beginning of the software history. And as you probably experienced on, by your own experience, uh, developing software uh, in monolithic application uh, where uh, there is a hundreds of thousands of lines of codes and dozens of developers committing to the same repository is uh, inefficient, uh, difficult, problematic, and generates, generates a lot of problem. In complex application, no single person has the full overview of the functionality of the application, and even onboarding new engineer and new developer to the team is difficult. So, evolving the software becomes slow, inefficient, and the risks of the introducing errors is increasing. So, from a long time ago, it was obvious that we need to cut this problem into smaller pieces and apply composition patterns similar to the microservices. This picture represents, let's say, kind of a comparison like uh, software can also be inspired by urban architecture and nice composition of very various technologies, techniques of making the front end really seamless, beautiful, and harmonic. So, often a single, uh, today, in, in today's world, even we are uh, resolve many problems of the backend development with the microservices approach. In today's world, many of the applications are still monolithic. They are still tied to the single JavaScript framework. In many organizations, they are still developed by the single large teams. And we need to, we need to do something about it to unlock the innovation, unlock speed of delivery, also for the, micro, for the front end development work. And today's, in today's session, we will learn uh, a little bit about how the different approach, how the different organizations can approach breaking down the monolithic uh, front ends with the approach similar to the microservices. We will also discuss some of the challenges that those approach uh, of microservices and micro front ends introducing to monolithic application. But before we move forward, uh, let's talk a little bit about ourselves, let's get to know each other a little bit better. So I'm software engineering manager at Relativity. I work on a new SaaS product, Relativity One, which is our uh, main cloud platform. And I'm working on data ingestion tools, which are integrating many different tools and many different solutions for ingestion of the data to the Relativity One. I love working with creative people, I love long time learning culture, I love quality, and love working with cross cultural team on the uh, ambitious and uh, common goals. Uh, have anybody, anybody here heard about the relativity? Can you raise your hand? Okay, a couple of them, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Marek. <laughs> so, relativity is e discovery software uh, dedicated to. Uh, litigation and investigation processes uh, in legal space. And uh, Relativity One is a cloud platform that is managing extensive, inf uh, extensive amount of information. For example, a single customer can handle at Relativity 500 millions of the documents with sizes uh, reaching hundreds of uh, petabytes of the information and with hundreds of different data data formats that are ingested into relativity and normalized for the further processing search and analysis so relativity has around 300,000 euro users around the globe which are spread across around 40 countries 40 countries they are serving thousands of organizations in legal space, in financial services space, and in the government space. So that's our main area of operation. Uh, Relativity has around 1,500 employees, 
spread around the globe, and uh, our Krakow office is the uh, second largest uh, center of excellence when top developers are revolutionizing our software and also making sure now that we are still behind in front in front of the our competition and relativity is uh, the market leader in the a discovery a discovery space so today we are going to talk about macro frontends what they are how they let's say become important and how we can find the similarities between development of microservices world and in micro frontends. Also, we will talk about why they are important for teams and for organizations. Uh, what are the drawbacks of the implementation of microservices? Also, we will talk a little bit about how we can do it, but this will be not technical session, just the highlights of how to approach it. And also, we'll talk about micro frontend decision framework. Uh, which uh, is important to as assess whether your application is, let's say, suitable and good choice for microfinance or not. And microfinance decision framework is concept, uh, let's say, proposed by uh, Luca Mazzarella. He is together with us today, and uh, we will have a look at at least a bit at at this topic. And if I go with the content right, we will have also some time for the questions and open discussion. So, before we jump to answer the question what the microfrontends are, let's have a look a little bit of the history of the software architecture. Uh, software architecture is the part of the software development area that always is following some optimization of money, resources, or effort to improve and implement let's say, a better solution for the future. And uh, as some of you, the older one, remember that in from 60s to 80s, every, let's say, architecture system was super monolithic. There were a couple of mainframe uh, system and connected to them silly terminals that were sending the instructions for, for execution. Everything because hardware was super expensive and limited in availability. When we jump to 1990s, we have changed the approach from the monoliths to uh, extended kind of availability of the hardware for computing, because uh, PCs and uh, home computers become cheaper and more available, and companies see big, big benefits, financial benefits in introducing them to everyone's company, everyone's home, in order to spread and implement a better calculation. However, architecture was still kind of distributed monolith, Applications were still monolithical, and uh, and it was actually just the copy of the previous solution to the to the to the, to the network. And in 2020s, internet connected exchange of the information, where we started to uh, cross-reference the websites, uh, but single pages were still. Monolithical. There was no idea in website of dynamic build of the website composition. Some some concept of uh, plugins that are extending functionality of the application were already known in desktop, but were applying. They were widely used in, in the desktop application. In 2010s, the system uh, become even more more connected, and in this in this time. Uh, application were built in kind of entire model and uh, software were, was, was cut in the horizontal layers just because of the technology split, how it was organized by vendors. And, and again, in this architecture, monoliths of the UI were still existing and everybody was, let's say, focused on splitting uh, software in the vertical layers. And now we are 2020s, where we need to interconnect intelligent systems that should work together, and we would like to do it a little bit more thoughtfully and efficiently. So, today's, in today's world, the architectures that are leading are the events-driven architecture, microservices, micro which are 
splitting the bigger problem of the solution to the smaller pieces that are manageable and easily to implement, deploy, deliver, and maintain. So this is calling also for some architecture change regarding the front end. And microservices were um, kind of premiered in 2011 year uh, at the architects conference where the people were talking about the, how to improve backend software development. And uh, it was the term uh, to name what, we, what they were actually doing, like splitting the problem into smaller pieces. Uh, at this time, early pioneers of the microservices implementation were Netflix and Amazon. And they were very successful with this approach and uh, proven that this idea is beneficial for the organizations and for the teams. Later, four year, five years later, actually, in 2016, the consultancy company ThoughtWorks, I think, first time put their uh, name microfrontend on the uh, technology radar. However, at this time, this technology did not, uh, let's say, got enough attention because of various limitations in the uh, implementation framework, JavaScript frameworks or other frameworks that were not ready to adopt, adopt the concept of micro frontends. And later in 2019, uh, there was significant also change maybe not the change, but again, Martin Follower was one of the authors that promoted the idea of micro frontends and micro frontend architecture. He wrote an article that uh, kind of grabbed the attention of the, of the wide, wider audience. And he proposes, uh, he defines the micro frontends as a uh, part of the website or component of the website or application that can be independently deployable for use by another, another parts of the system. And uh, in order to extend a little bit this definition, because it's very loose definition, some of other architects uh, define that in addition that this part of the application is in independently deployable, it should be also uh, constructed and divided in a way that represents the value for the end customer, that end customer can use it and have some benefits. For example, uh, we can think of uh, authentication component. This is a service which could consist the backend microservice and some parts of the front end that is uh, vertically cut off from the system, and you can independently deploy. Customer can log in, log out to the system or sign in, sign up. However, they cannot make any more use of it because this is very narrow functionality, but it's working. You can prove it, you can test it, you can reuse it in any other places of your system where you want without any changes or redoing implementation of the, of the screen. And in addition, in micro frontend concept, there is an idea of host page or the container page, which is maintaining all the necessary runtime and configuration to execute micro frontends. For example, he, the host application can, can allow to registration of the micro frontend, can also host shared components or shared libraries that particular micro frontend can use them and load them, that they are coexisting in the single composition of the page. In addition, the micro frontends can be built with different technologies, like you can have uh, one part in React, another part in Angular, another part in Node, and when everything is done and configured properly, those three components run in the uh, compose page seamlessly and properly. <coughs> As we talk, there is several benefits of the micro frontend architecture, and we will talk them about them in a minute. However, as you can see, 
microfrontage architecture also introduces new level of the complexity, and this level of complexity is uh, something that will be discussed discuss in, in a couple of minutes. However, as you can see, uh, we have evolution of the software that left, left the broke, breaking down of the front ends to the smaller, more manageable pieces a little bit behind. We did great work at the back end defining service-oriented architecture, microservices, and breaking down all the back end logic to the smaller components. And now we need to take care about the front ends, that front ends can unblock the speed of delivery and also unblock progress and innovation in the companies. So, why micro frontends are powerful? We look at it this from the both the team's perspective and also from the company perspective. Looking at the benefits from team's perspective, implementation of microservices together with micro frontends is enabling the team scalability because we can cut functionality of the complex application into smaller, more, more manageable pieces which can be owned and run by the independent team. So you can, you can also break down the given portion of the application to many vertical departments, many teams and many repositories. And then can be, they can be developed by single teams or one team can own or develop multiple uh, services. However, they are independent and they can be reused in many places of the, of the, of the system. Additionally, implementation of micro front ends is uh, allowing and simplifying the extensibility of large application. If you can imagine uh, that we have a big application, which is really complex and have a lot of in interdependencies and a lot of connected code, it's difficult to uh, kind of extend it. There is a huge risk of the problems and huge risk of the regression. If you have better isolation of the microservices with corresponding micro front end, which takes care about the vertically, vertically isolated functionality of the application, there is much simpler logic, much less code to maintain and also simplified the learning curve of, of the understanding such a kind of application. And then this can be distributed among different teams. And we are going to the single responsibility of uh, the code of the microservice and micro front end. The practice and uh, also a lot of research around this area has shown that it's significantly easier to extend and manage uh, application functionality where you have dedicated team and teams all the own the decision and owns implementation evolution of the application end to end that they are taking care about everything about the front end business logic back end storage caching and all the architecture is under their control and their decision they are able to collaborate closely with the customer understand deeply what the customer needs and implement those changes without any blocking parts. They don't have to wait on other team to uh, implement and release the functionality with new functionality for the customer. Another important benefit for the team is the speed of delivery, that when we have uh, microservices and micro front ends separated and isolated. We have smaller portion of the code that it's much easier to uh, build, test, deploy, maintain, and deliver. And with the good level of automation, you can deliver such a changes on a daily basis. So you can work with customer on one day on the given idea, and next day you can ship the production code to the system, which is actually in cloud or in other distributed distributed environment. And as we already mentioned, microservices and micro front ends are simplifying learning curve for teams. If new team member is joining, for him it will be way, way easier to understand smaller scope of, of the complete functionality than dig in the whole big monolithic application with 
tons of dependencies and tons of required configuration just to run and debug and test such application. If we are with the concept of micro frontends and microservices, this application can be fired one, one simple link independently of anything else, and such a developer can start working on it and understand in a number of, let's say, days. At Relativity, teams have objective that each new joiner who is coming to the team is delivering his high-quality code to the production after 20 days from the start date. So that's the benefits you are getting uh, for the team. Let's look uh, how it looks like from organization perspective. Introduction of microservices reinforces domain-driven domain -driven design and domain-driven architecture, where you have to rethink how you build, interconnect the components of your system or application. And then it is, it is let's say, better the services which are delivered by application are better understood, better partitioned, better documented. Usually you should have something like service catalog which uh, collects the information about all available services, what functionality and domain functions are available for consumption. And this is introducing more clarity and understanding for the organization. Also, microservices and microfrontends encourage re reusability in this sense that if the microservice and microfrontend are isolated, it's much easier to use this part of the software in another system or in another deployment or in another configuration of your services for the customers. Additionally, it is also much easier to expose your service for consumption by your business customers, for example. You can build a particular service, and if this functionality is super useful and it's nice for the customers, you can just expose it for the other applications and scale your business much quicker, much faster. Similarly, if you are acquiring some business and this business is implemented with microservices and micro front end approach, you can probably much easier integrate it into your current current, let's say, domain structure, and particular variety like our function can be integrated, integrated when you want, how you want. You don't need to re-implement the new acquired part of the technology to the same technology stack. You have full flexibility when to do it and how to do it. How about the technology lock-in? We just mentioned that frameworks Microfrontends uh, frameworks and microfrontends can be uh, completely independent and can, they can be built with the different technology. So we have seen the companies that were spending large budgets to just re-implement the application from one framework to another because of the advantages of the performance or usability or flexibility of the other framework. With microfrontends, you don't have to do it. Of course, you can, but you don't have to. You have still ability to maintain the w one part of the micro frontend or micro frontends with microservices which are using the old Angular, for example, technology, and you don't have to redo it to leverage uh, benefits of Vue, for example. You can just focus on implementation in Vue the new components and new services who, which are most desired for the business and most necessary for your growth of the organization. And the last point, but not least, implementation of the microservices and microfrontends in organization improves innovation performance. Maybe it's a good, bad word, you know, innovation performance, but what I mean behind it, um, to inspire innovations, companies need to unlock any kind of technical, organizational, or psychological barriers that prohibits the team from taking the ownership and drive their destiny. If we separate the complete functionality vertically, that team fully owns it end-to-end -end and is not dependent and not waking on any other organizational part with implementation of the extended functionality or additional 
API layer or communication layer to better integrate with other areas of the system, those team is super motivated and empowered to do much more for customer satisfaction than the team which has constraints that can, they cannot modify the complete software because they are locked in some problems that they depend on other team, the other team is busy doing something else and this is not the priority for them. In microservices and micro frontends, we have full autonomy, full ownership, and with the proper automation, automated test, automated deployment pipelines, teams are able to deliver software in a matter of, let's say, days, daily builds, daily deployments, daily releases, or weekly deployments, weekly releases. And the customer is getting the software immediately. You are getting the software feedback immediately on the new functionality, and the loop, feedback loop is much faster. And this is what I mean by improving the innovation performance. <clears throat> what are the drawbacks of the micro frontends? Is everything perfect in micro frontends? Definitely no. Definitely there are, let's say, problems you have to be aware of and weigh the decision how you go about them. Let's just focus on the, again, find points that are, in my opinion, key or important to, to discuss and, and uh, consider when deciding about the micro frontends approach. Similarly, like with the microservices approach, for micro frontends decision and segregation of the functionality, you need to the, discuss and also verify how you would like to reorganize your application. How do you want to break down the particular pieces, pieces of, the, of the functionality that are not tied with other components of, the, of your application too much? This requires upfront thinking, upfront design work, and upfront product work that is necessary to avoid problems later. However, I personally believe that in today's world, all of you, while implementing new functionality, are collaborating with product people or UX design people, and who don't do it? Who don't do it, actually? No one, no one <laughs> admits that he's not collaborating with UX designs. Yes, and this is super important, but can be problematic if you don't have habits and don't have good skills in your teams that can help you with this. And as we mentioned earlier, cutting software to smaller pieces, independently where backend, frontend, middleware, requires more communication in between the components in order to ensure consistent flow of the information. And this communication can expose another, let's say, difficulties related to related to integration, seamless integration of the services, microservices and micro frontends as well. So, good thing is that if you were experimenting with microservice technology and uh, microservice architecture, you already should have some communication layers that already exist, and probably you can leverage some pieces of them for micro frontends communication. However, in the microservices, implementation, micro frontends implementation, we will need to probably add another, another ways of communication. We'll go back to this topic in a, in a moment. And again, another problem that you are probably aware of, anybody is working extensively with integration of different pages to the one application? How about CSSs? How, like, how do you like it? <laughs> it's awesome, yeah? So the same problem is with micro frontends because the undesired and unwanted overlaps of CSS styles can lead that your application composition in the uh, final page looks may look messy if you are, didn't address the CSS problem. And how can you do it? Actually, there are at least two two ways you can you can approach this. One is introduction of dedicated IDs in front of, in front of front-end divs regions, and then configuring, for example, Webpack to insert the same IDs in front of your CSS, that your CSS become unique. 
And another way to go over this problem is uh, applying solutions like block elements modifiers, which does a similar thing, but maybe on the class level, that uh, Beam exactly encourages you to think about the entire project as a set of reusable components for the web, for which the class names should be unique in your entire project, so you can kind of better manage the problem with the CSSs. And the next problem you should be aware of is the performance. As we talked at the beginning, we also mentioned that the microphones can improve the performance. Yes, they can. But they can be also implemented in a way that performance is even worse. If you have composition of your web page that is built from several JavaScript frameworks that have to work at the same time in parallel, they require additional CPU, additional memory, additional network traffic to, to download it to work. And that's the problem, because if you are not managing this risk and allowing your company to freely evolve, use versions, whatever they want, you end up in very heavy page with the very different version of the same, let's say, framework spread across, across different micro frontends. And this is exactly the problem we'd like to avoid. And the ways to avoid this problem is, of course, think up front what can be brought up as a minimum required set of shared components for your website and embed them, embed them to uh, your host page or container page that they are loaded once, instantiated once, and they can be referenced by each of your micro frontend component. Uh, this is a difficult task and can lead to many problems. However, the changes in uh, Webpack 5 and Module Federation, Module Federation plugin have simplified the life of developers significantly uh, because the web Pack 5 model federation is doing all the heavy lifting for you. So it's, it is able to resolve the model dependencies for you and is allowing also to run different, f different framework libraries at the same time in your page without any runtime errors. So, and we already talked about the dependencies that can be redundant, yes. And also another part can be redundant that if you take into account the requirement that your microphone then should run independently of each other, uh, each microphone then probably will have some additional dependencies that he have to own, load, and manage to be able to run independently. And some pieces of the code or some pieces of HTML can be redundant in such a, such a case. However, if you are creating the project with shared web com components that can be loaded by your host on cont container page, you can easily, easily cross-reference those elements to avoid duplication and redundancy of the, of the code in your, in your page. I started to talk a little bit about the Webpack 5 model federation, which indeed changed the game. And this is the feature that introduces a little bit more standardized way to optimize how modules and dependencies are loaded, shared, and maintained in the, in, in the code. Model federations allow you to define, define the shared modules across the micro frontends and helps you, help you to load load the dependencies. Let's look what, what, what actually it is. So one of the first uh, extension to uh, Webpack is the remotes. In the previous, let's say, frameworks, you have to depend on build and deployment of the web component who have to exist and be available for, for the compiler to integrate your solution and to run. 
in this model federation extension, you can define the remotes. It's something that declares, okay, this will be the model for the integration of my website, and you can take it from there. And you are specifying this model via URL, which can be loaded later dynamically. And the exports. In order to get the remote running, you have to define in different models which parts of your page are exportable and exposed, exposed for consumption by all the remotes. And this gives you ability to containerize pieces of your functionality and easily integrate to the host container page in micro frontend. And also additional dynamic imports functions that were introduced to a model federation in Webpack 5 is allowing you to not load and import the packages upfront, but you can load them later conditionally or on demand. And here is the idea that we need to follow, that we need to follow the context of the user and be aware of what the user is at the moment doing and only load for him the components that are applicable in his context. For example, if user is not authenticated in monolith application, you will load everything together, even you have to just show the sign-in page for the user. If you are breaking down nicely application into the several micro and micro, micro services, you know that if the user is not logged in, you just need to show him sign-in page or change the password page, and that's it. Rest not necessary is not necessary at this moment, and that's why you can also improve performance of your application significantly and get rid of all the dependencies that are not needed in this context for this customer. And there is an enormous amount of cases where you can leverage this, this idea to optimize your application. And shares, shared closure is allowing you exactly to declare which of the components in your microservices and your host page are reusable. So you can define them, okay, that those components like Angular Core in this version will be reusable in all my micro frontends, and all the micro frontends that are consuming this can use already instantiated versions of those components in your host page, and they don't need to instantiate them again, and they don't need to uh, load additional resources again. So those compositions can be defined based on the vertical responsibilities of the application. And as we mentioned about the example with authentication, you can distinguish much more functionality that can be separated. Like for example, in this example, you can separate search profile or card to another micro and microservices, which can be then in the independently developed with different technology with limited scope of responsibility just to the just the pieces they have to be responsible for and they they have to they don't have to know about each of other micro frontends and microservices until the moment that the page we are in have to interact somehow uh, between each of the micro frontends to follow customer interactions and to indicate that there are some customer interactions. Uh, here is an example from Relativity 1 that we are actually experimenting with. Uh, in Relativity 1, as we mentioned, we are importing uh, dozens of different formats from hundreds of different sources, and uh, each source requires different type of the logic, business logic, and different type of uh, front-end configuration to configure and run the import job. And that's why, that's why we are, let's say, experimenting with complete vertical, vertical breakdown of our application into uh, isolated micro front-ends with underlying microservices, which can run completely independently of each other. And they don't need to know 
much about themselves, with except for the information that the end user would like to know what is going on with the entire import processes that he initiated. And for this reason, we are coming up with design that is able to show the user, okay, how many actually jobs of import, export, or other types are running, uh, what they already accomplished, what is the progress percentage, and this is what is hosted in the host or container page. It, this page aggregates and presents the information for the, new, for the end user, and this output is generated by those different, different micro services and micro frontends. Ah, this is the mm, kind of example with the statistic that we are showing. Uh, yes, we mentioned that we will come back to the communication that microservices and micro frontends uh, need to live and work together. And uh, we also mentioned that implementing microservices, you already have some infrastructure for the communication. And usually this microservices communication infrastructure is related to background processing logic that you need, you need to replicate some data, you need to send some messages or events, you are using for it some event hub, for example, or service bus or streams to send information between the microservices. In case of introduction of micro frontends, you need to, yeah, in ideal world, it would be perfect if the microservices are vertically isolated, so they don't know to know about each other at all. But we know that in practice, this is not possible, and sometimes we need to interact and exchange the information for them. That, for example, we can uh, manage the queues of the information or any of the job that is running have to report the progress to the end user that he knows what is going on with the given, given microservice, and these pieces of the communication are required. And here are the elements you can introduce, like, for example, if you like to fire up some additional microphone, then you can just use it use the query parameter string. Or you can use change status events in your application. You can also in introduce and implement and trigger and listen for the custom event within the browser. This allows you to communicate within the, within the browser, within the, let's say, host page between the micro frontends. Frontends will need to fetch some data from the corresponding uh, microservices, and for this, we are today using uh, REST, REST protocol and REST communication. This is something what is obvious, and we know it. I just wanted to focus a little bit of attention on GraphQL, which is the open source uh, query language. Uh, why it's nice? It's nice because in REST, you have to ask for any type of data separately and you are getting separated responses from each of the endpoints. In GraphQL, you can define the flow and query in the way that GraphQL exposes you one endpoint with one response that you were asking for, and the response contains only those information you were asking for, nothing more, nothing else. And this information is already composed and packaged in the nice graph structure, so you can reuse it and uh, be much more efficient than in case of calling REST. So, <coughs> I, uh, present you, I presented you a lot of information, okay, what you can do, how uh, you can improve your work on the, of the team, and how, how you can change your technology adoption but how we can really assess the suitability of our application for microphone dense approach. And uh, uh, I was researching a lot of materials regarding uh, microphone dense and would like to recommend you the front dense decision framework by 
Luca Mazzarella, Mazzarella, sorry, Mazzarella. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, it's not paid advertisement, believe me. <laughs> uh, I, I've seen that uh, Luca put a lot of his heart into explaining why the given pros and cores are important in your case, in your application, in your technology. And uh, I feel this is one of the most complete and professional liter literature, literature and work you can, you can use in this area. By the way, Luca is presenting tomorrow at 9.30. If you want to learn more, you can go and check and talk with Luca later. So, uh, mainly speaking, if I would need to summarize what the components and factors of the decisions are for going with micro frontends or no, I will distinguish those four di dimensions, like complexity of your application, complexity of your content you have to manage and the interactions you have to manage, organizational structure, how you are ready with the teams and ownership structure, and uh, how you are ready to give the teams full freedom and power in deciding for themselves, because this is not obvious that teams can do what they want in many organizations. Second, sorry, the third factor is the performance, you expectation, performance expectation. You need to know, okay, how many interactions my page is actually doing, uh, how they are heavy, uh, how can I eliminate them or spread them or cut them into the, let's say, less impactful uh, interactions for the page communication, because this is the key problem. And also, how good I am with the observability of my application, that when I introduce a change and uh, this change is kind of degrading performance, I will know it quicker than my customers, and will know that my SLLs were breached, and I have to roll back this change and do some investigation, okay, why my performance are pure at this time. And finally, we are we're talking about the innovation, how you are ready for the innovation and how quickly you can innovate, because you can be in the very different, uh, let's say, verticals or sectors if the, of the software development, where, for example, in pharmaceutical business, you are able to change software once a year, for example. And I personally believe it would not make much sense to go with the full ownership and full, uh, let's say, division, microservices, micro frontends uh, with your application if you have no flexibility in experimenting, going through fast feedback loops, loops with your customers, but you are locked in the, in the kind of rigid framework of regulated market software changes. And of course, the important thing is product maturity, where you are with your product. If your product is complete and let's say it's selling like hell, maybe it's not the right time to uh, jump on the completely restructuring of the architecture. It works to consider, okay, how my future looks like and what uh, can impact my evolution to the future, but it would be maybe not wise. Uh, if you are a startup company and you are looking for customers and want to deliver software quickly, definitely the full microservice implementation architecture micro frontend is probably not the best choice because it will cost you additional time. Of course, you can think and should think about the isolation of the functionalities in a proper way that when your company grows and business is scaling, you should be able to decompose into the proper microservice and micro frontend architecture. However, this should not be the first shot. I wanted to leave at least one minute for the questions. So now it's the time for questions and comments. Anyone? Okay, things to remember from the session today. We need definitely open architecture to evolve development of the front ends. We need better composition. Uh, there are definitely benefits for the companies with and for, for the large application from microser microservices and micro frontends. 
be aware of all the risks and challenges that we've discussed, weigh your decision carefully. I already mentioned Luca did a great job on walking you through by hand after all the decision points. Uh, treat your UI components as a independently deliverable pieces that represents the value for the customers and can be reused by other teams without any additional dependencies. And we, I personally believe we are in this change moment where there is much more going on on the market that UI frameworks are already adopting, allowing for implementation of the micro front ends with much better, much better uh, results. And of course, as always, in architecture decisions, there is no free benefits. There are always trade-offs, and all the benefits come at some cost. So you have to be very wise, reasonable, read a lot, learn a lot, and experiment a lot. So thank you very much for your time and attention this afternoon. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you.